Hey nerds, welcome back. I'm Tyler. Today I'm going to show you the cheapest, easiest way I've been able to find to make shaker style cabinet doors and drawers. If you're watching this video, likely you've got something like this. This is a basic cabinet door. This is what came with our house. There's nothing wrong with it. Nice solid wood, floating panel. You can tell it's got like kind of that drum sound. This will last. They're strong, they're sturdy, they're dependable but they're not exactly in style anymore. This is what you see in style. This is a shaker style cabinet door. You'll see this in newer homes and in magazines all over the place. Don't let it fool you though. This design's from the 1800s, so there's nothing new about this. It's a nice straight square profile. The styles and rails are nice straight and square, and that's really good news for us because it's easy to build. What separates my method from the typical method is normally you're gonna get three quarter inch material and it's normally gonna be some sort of hardwood. Well, if you're painting, you don't really need hardwood. And on top of that, hardwood has some issues in itself. Hardwood expands and contracts and you'll see little gaps in between your rails and styles in the panel over time. MDF or HDF, you won't. Quickly, let's talk about the difference between MDF and HDF. MDF is what you'll find anywhere. It's cheap, medium density fiberboard. That's what it stands for. HDF is like MDF, but it's got a higher density to it. So it can put up with more abuse. It's actually even rated for higher exposure to moisture and water. It is also though more expensive. So for us to keep in a tight budget, I went with MDF. And I know already you're rolling your eyes. This idiot is making something that moves around that's gonna get beat up out of MDF. How is that supposed to last? Well, let me tell you, we've had these doors and drawers installed in our high use, high humidity, high temperature changing bathroom for over a year at this point, And I can't see any damage on these. There's no separation between the rails and styles. There's no separation between the panel and the rails and styles. There's no stress cracks, nothing. It just, it's, it seems to be fine. If you have experience though, and you've done something like this and it negatively impacted you or positively impacted you, leave it in the comments section below and I encourage everyone to go down there and read and see what you can find. For us though and our tests, I don't see a reason why this method won't work. Some of the things that we did here like glued the panel in so it's not a floating panel. This adds to the strength and stability of the rails and styles. To touch a little bit on the conditions that this is exposed to, our bathroom is the worst bathroom for cabinet doors and drawers. It's got high use. My wife and I open this specific door at least three times every day, me twice, her once. The door's exposed to high humidity. There's no separation between the shower and where the cabinets are. And because this is in the master bedroom, it's subject to high temperature swings as well. We sleep at 69 degrees. 69. <laughs> <laughs> and in the day, it goes up to 78. So that's almost a 10 degree temperature swing that if this was hardwood, it would absolutely be moving. I also feel like I have the responsibility to let you know that out of all the materials we've talked about, MDF is the softest. So if you're more physically abusive than verbally abusive to your cabinets, you suck, you suck. You may wanna consider something stronger, especially if you have children. Other benefits to sheet goods like MDF is they come flat and parallel. You don't have to spend hours and hours milling to get a nice flat straight board. The issue with hardwoods are if you buy them rough, it's gonna take you a long time to get just a flat straight board. But if you decide to buy them pre-milled, it's gonna cost you a fortune. So MDF wins there also. And let me say, we did our bathroom for about 50 bucks with leftover materials. I can see you doing an entire kitchen for anywhere between two to $500, depending of course on how many cabinet doors and drawers you have. With all that being said, because this is such a simple profile and style, it doesn't take a table saw scientist to be able to cut this out. You should be able to complete this with pretty basic table saw skills. Let me show you how I did it. Put your pants on, let's get to building. 
Before we jump into it, I want to talk about terminology of cabinet doors. The horizontal components are the rails and they sit in between the styles, which are the vertical components. And in the center, we have the panel. Hopefully this helps as we go through this process. General consensus for the width of the styles and rails for your cabinet doors and drawers is anywhere from two to two and a half inches. For me, I'm gonna split that down the center and do two and a quarter inches for these. Be considerate of the shape and size of your drawers. You don't wanna have wide rails and styles and a really skinny, strange looking panel in between. I'm showing off this added length for my auxiliary fence. It really helps with cutting sheet goods. And here is my one man setup for cutting long sheet goods. I've got this cool little roller supporter that I put in the back and it helps keep the sheets manageable. I'm showing you here my setup for cutting the styles. I have a simple stop block over here with my miter saw stand. So it's kind of built in. It's a really cool stand. I'll, I'll link it if it's still available. If you're having trouble figuring out your measurements for this, I made a measurement video. You don't wanna just measure your old cabinet doors and drawers and then recreate them at the same size. You may want to change the gaps to be a closer, tighter gap or a bigger gap or a larger or smaller drawer door. So check that video out. I'll link it right here. I promise you it's the easiest way that I've been able to find how to do this. The rails were an awkward length for me to try and put together some sort of stop block solution for. So instead of spending the time doing that, I just paid extra attention to the lengths, made sure I was accurate on my measurements and my cuts. And here's the result, a perfectly cut set of rails and styles for two doors. I would also recommend cutting a couple extra, a couple extra styles and a couple extra rails. Here they are. Like I was saying, the terminology is gonna help. I, and I label them styles and rails so I don't goof up somehow. But yeah, cut extras, you're gonna need uh, on top of that a piece of scrap. This is gonna help you sneak up on the perfect data width. What I got here is five mil plywood, which is also about 3 16 What we're gonna do is take our scrap piece. This is how we're gonna sneak, sneak up on our perfect dado. Use the uh, plywood scrap. I suggest cutting one out if you don't have one. Then keep it handy for the future. Set it up in the center as best as you can and make some pencil marks in the center as close as you can. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna use this as a guide. And you'll see in a second why perfection doesn't actually matter. This is just how we start. Set your table saw for a 3 8 inch deep dado cut. I'm using this neat little setup block, but you can use whatever you like. Then this is why perfection doesn't matter. We're gonna cut inside these pencil lines and slowly sneak up on that cut and using the scrap piece only. So don't forget you're using the scrap piece. We're gonna run it through once this way, flip it over and make sure that it's equal cuts on both sides. Labeling them helps actually. And if I start always with the label on the outside, I know what I've done and what I haven't. So I run it through once, flip it over. Now the label's in towards the fence. And as by design, the five mil piece actually won't fit in the slot yet. So we want to sneak up on this. So the first one, we want to be so tight it doesn't fit. Give the fence a little tippity tap and then run it through again on both sides. Very, very minor adjustments. It may take you a few different times before it fits. And at this point, nice and snug. Uh, you don't want to have to like really force it in. You don't want to have to really be able to put a lot of force to pull it out, but sitting in there by itself so that it doesn't fall out, that's really the sweet spot. Now that our scrap piece fits perfectly with the panel, we're gonna set that aside. We know that our fence is dialed in. Now we could run all of our pieces through. I'm gonna run all my rails and all my styles through. Again, I'm going to make sure that I have the labeled side on the out first, flip it over, run it through a second time. And likely what I'll do, you know, I'll, I'll take this and I'll test it. I know that I just did the scrap piece, but it doesn't hurt to double check everything. And just like we were talking about, it fits perfect, man. So at this point, you know for sure that the rest of your pieces are good. Go ahead and run all of your rails and all your styles through using that process. At this point, you really can't mess this up. It's super easy. 
hey, just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. I do all this stuff for free. I don't have any sponsorships or anything like that. So if you're enjoying the video and you haven't subscribed yet, I hope today's the day that I can earn that subscription. If you're looking to support the channel in other ways, I've tried my hand at shirt designs. Now, heads up, this is mostly 16-year-old guy humor, fart and wiener jokes until the day I die, but that link is in the description to that shirt shop as well. And lastly, if you're the type of person that would take a buddy out for helping you with a project, and in this case, I'm your buddy and I helped you out with your project, and you'd like to buy me a drink, there's information in the description for that as well. But I just wanted to say thank you, I really appreciate you watching. Let's get back to the build. I'm gonna be using my Inkro 1000 HD miter gauge. If you're in the market for one, this one's sick. It has all the angles and uh, very easy to dial in. But the one that you have with your saw will work fine. Or if you have like a miter sled or something like that, that'll also work. But I'm going to set this up. I'm gonna use a stop block here. And I'm gonna set this up for the 3 8 inch dado that we cut earlier. And that way the tenon basically that we're cutting out here will fit in that 3 8 inch mortise or groove or dado, whatever you want to call it. I would suggest just like before cutting short on this and then sneaking up on that cut to get the perfect depth for what's basically going to be a tenon on the edge of, on the edge of this. So what we're doing here, this is a, another representation. On the top, we've got the style where the rails are going to sit into, connect into. And on the bottom, we've got the rail. So what we're trying to do is we're going to remove this material here and it's going to create a tenon, right? So let's just shade this in as a representation. We're going to remove this material and then you're going to have a tenon that's going to fit into the dado that we've already cut, the 3 8 inch dado. So let's go ahead and take this in. I'll try and give you more visual. Set the height of your blade to the exact height of what's left over from that dado cut. And I actually made a mark here. This is the apex of my blade height. So I know at that point or around that point, that's as high or as deep of a cut as I'm gonna get with that table saw. But yeah, I'm gonna nibble away at, at each side of this and it's gonna end up like this, just like I was saying. This is basically gonna be a tenon after everything's said and done after we cut some of these pieces off. But let me show you from different angles uh, how to do this. All right, so the cool thing about having a stop block is it prevents you from going any further. So the stop block should be the furthest point of your cut right along that line. And then as you come through here, you pull away from the stop block until you're on the very edge of that material and all of it will have been removed at that point so as you see here the stop block this is the stop block run and that is on the very line that's as far as i want to go and then i just move it a little bit closer each time to the edge and slowly remove the remainder of those pieces creating the tenon that i'm that i desire as i go through too to remove any high spots I'll, I'll move this over the blade and while it's over the blade, I'll pull the piece across the blade and that you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when you get there. You'll have like these peaks, these little peaks from like, you know, maybe a, a spot that you didn't cross over with the blade. Here I go again with, with that technique. And so dragging it across the blade completely flattens it out. So just trust me, check it out. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when you get there. If you've got a gap between your rail and style that looks like this, that means that your fence is too far away from the blade and you're cutting too much off. Simply tap the fence closer to the blade and you should close that gap up. This is really what you're looking for. If you've got a gap in between the tenon and your dado, then tap the fence the other direction. And this is still just the test piece. If you screw up, just rip the end off and keep going, try again. At this point, I'm done with the tenons on all the rails, but mine are a little tight. Instead of adjusting the saw blade and trying to run them through again, I recommend using sandpaper to make minor adjustments to the fit. When measuring for the cut for the panel, perfection may screw you over. So for me, I cut an eighth inch short on the height and width, and this gives me a little bit of wiggle room to account for any imperfections with the dados on the rails or styles. 
To avoid some of the splintering on the panel, use some painter's tape, especially with the miter saw. A little bit of painter's tape, and for me, the cuts turn out nice and clean. In fact, cleaner than a duck fart. Even with nice clean cuts though, you're gonna to wanna to bevel the edges of these panels. It'll make glue up a lot easier so that these panels slide into those dados with no problem. Components are done at this point. It's time for the glue up. I'm gonna glue the panel into the dados. This isn't typical. Usually you have a floating panel with no glue, but this should add to the structural integrity, something you might need if you're gonna go with half inch material like myself. This should also add to the moisture resistance as you're sealing off all these extra gaps. Because we're using MDF and plywood, we don't have to worry about wood movement, so gluing's totally acceptable. I clamp it down. I do have a couple of high spots here. I'm gonna use some sandpaper to even those out, and then I'm gonna go around the whole thing and I'm gonna soften up the edges. On the outside here, you can see just a just barely a little bit of a round over just to soften that up, and then I go on the inside as well with that sanding block, and like I said, just take some of the edge off and then sand the whole thing down. When you're done with sanding, wipe it down with a damp rag and then go through and caulk all of these spaces between the panel, the rails, and the styles. This is necessary, I think, for keeping moisture out. Moving on to cutting out the recesses for the soft close hinges. I've got a three millimeter or eighth inch offset. This Craig jig for this is amazing. I'll link this down in the description below. Super easy to use. It made installing these hinges a breeze. I'm going to align one side with the bottom of the rail here, clamp it down in place on both sides. Keep in mind any screw ups. On this side, I've got a little scratch here. This is gonna be on the inside where the cabinet door faces the cabinet. And then I'm going to, like I showed before, hook up my drill to the Forzner bit and drill away, man. I did set this up so I knew the depth that I'm cutting. And like I said, this template is sick. If you guys haven't checked this out, I really recommend this Craig jig for doing these things. I couldn't imagine it being easier. It's, it has a spot for you to hold a dust collection hose, but here's a couple different views of how that works. And then here are those soft close hinges, just kind of demonstrating that it drilled perfectly. While you went to get another beer, I painted. I did four coats of this really cool opaque green now because we're done painting we can go ahead and add in these hinges this to wall impact is really neat it's got a delicate setting on it setting one for materials that would get stripped out if you really try and crank down on them instead of just blowing through the material this realizes the resistance and stops at that so that you don't just strip out that hole so all i have to do is line it up it's on setting one it drives through and it automatically stops. It even makes a little beeping noise when it hits that resistance level. Remember when I said cut a couple extra of your rails and your styles just in case? Well, you wanna cut one extra for this specific reason. What you're gonna do is you're gonna replicate one of your styles. This is gonna really help you mount your doors without all the extra weight. So cut an extra style, drill out the holes for the hinges, and then you can map on your cabinet doors really easy how high or low you need for your reference points. And again, this is something that you'll be able to get from my measurement video that I was talking about before, but you've got equal distance on the top and the bottom. Line it up with your rails for your cabinet faces, and you can make your marks and then drill your pilot holes to screw the hinges into the face frames of the cabinets. I'm really happy with these hinges. The previous cabinet doors didn't have soft close. And now that I do, I feel like I upped the class of this bathroom quite a bit. I know it sounds kind of funny, but they, they're super classy, man. And I know this part's probably pretty boring for those of you that know what you're doing, but for any newbies out there, I just kind of wanted to show you my technique for screwing these in. I use a foot to hold the cabinet door up. And then just like before, drill out your pilot holes and then screw those babies in. And it will take you a little bit. It took me a little while to dial in all the adjustments for the hinges. They, you know, they never install perfect, especially if you're like me and your house comes with real basic cabinetry. I mean, come on, look at those drawers. They're not even aligned, man. There, there's no alignment going on there. Everything was the cheapest possible, and we're going to tackle that now. In the interest of time, I didn't film myself making the drawer faces. 
It's the exact same procedure, the same width for the styles and rails. I would just caution you to make sure that the style and rail combination isn't gonna make that panel too small for you. These drawers that I'm working on now and that I just dropped a face for, they did use very small panels, but I think it looked really nice. Just something to consider. I nailed a bunch of crap together to create a spacer for the back portion here. All this basically does is hold the drawers forward. Proud of the face frame of the cabinet. This way, when I go to install the drawers, I got a little wiggle room there to work with. And specifically, this will be helpful as I'm using a nice little drawer clamp system that I'll show you here in a second. To ensure that the drawers meet up with the bottom of the doors, I'm gonna clamp a piece of MDF here on the bottom. And this is where we're gonna start our installation for the drawer faces. The method here to make sure that you're centered is measure out the entire space and subtract the measurement of your drawer face and then divide the remainder in two. That's how much you'll have on each side of the drawer. And I suggest measuring the top and bottom to make sure that these spaces are equal. Now I've got a bunch of different clamping systems that I paid for, you're welcome. And I tested them out to see if they would work well. These ones were god awful. Do not buy these, it's a waste of money. These ones are sick, but they don't actually work on these tiny drawers. If you're doing like a full kitchen or something where you have regular sized drawers, I actually highly recommend those red ones. These blue ones though, are they're nice, they work, they're just slower. And these ended up being the solution for me. If you're looking for them, all of these, actually not the first ones, cause they're crap. I won't have those in the description, but the other two, these are Rockler. I'll have these in the description as well as the red ones. And again, after you make your measurements and you know how much to include on each side, I recommend making little spacer blocks. It's just so much easier, man. And it guarantees you the same spacing all the way around. And so after I have these clamped in, these clamps hold it really well. So no issues there for me. They they hold the, the face frame right up against the, the drawer box. And then I'm able to drill out my pilot holes and then screw in my screws with no issues. Just like we used a spacer for the sides, I also recommend one for in between. Now, again, if you follow that measurement video that I made, you'll know exactly what your measurements should be in between each of your drawers, and then you'll be able to cut your spacer exactly to that detail. One thing I would recommend keeping an eye out for is your panel will not accept a screw. So make sure when you're drilling your pilot holes and figuring out where you're gonna drive your screws into, that you're going into the thick MDF and not that thin plywood panel. It will go straight through and you'll be pissed because at this point everything's basically done and you will have ruined your drawer face. Due to the adjustments that you make on the cabinet doors, your drawers actually might not be absolutely perfect. The spacers were just a hair too tight. They still would have fit, but they probably would have removed a little bit of paint. This is something you should anticipate. We're not perfect. Your cabinet carcass likely isn't perfect. There's all kinds of variables at play here that make this an imperfect science. So do with what you can, the best that you can. And I recommend just aligning the drawer faces vertically so that they're on the same plane. And as you can see here, it's really imperceivable by the human eye. You can't tell that there's a difference. I promise you, you can't because it's almost immeasurable and 500 times better than what we started off with. As for the toe kick, I'm gonna install that. You'll see in the final video. I'm sure you saw it in the intro. This freaking little mini shop vac, whatever you want to call this by DeWalt is dope, dude. I've been using this for quite a while now. It's awesome for a little project cleanup for your car or like if your wife breaks a glass, I've been using it a lot for that. She, um, love the woman, but she is clumsy. Here I am installing these clear little rubber bumpers for the doors and drawers. You only need to do it for the drawers on the top corners. And then for the doors, I do it on the top and bottom. This stops from the paint sticking to itself and it keeps the doors parallel with the hinges. You can make your own jig for your cabinet door pulls, but I'm using the Craig jig for this. 
and it worked perfectly, man. You can set it up exactly to the distance for your hardware and then figure out exactly where you want to lay it out. I want mine roughly about there. And I found a marking on here to reference next to the rail on the top. Clamp it in place and then drill straight through. Just like you would expect, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, no problem. Pop that baby off, dust off any of the dust and then install. And I really like this gold green combination. This is something my wife came up with. Check me out, just appreciating this color combination. And guess what? I did a good job. I deserve a donut. Don't ask me where I found this. It was just deep in that cabinet, but it's tasty. And that's it, we're done. My wife and I use and abuse this thing every day. It's in the moisture, it's in the humidity. I haven't had any issues. If I was a lawyer though, I'd probably say go with the three quarter inch, go with the HDF, not the MDF, just because it's a higher density. It's more made for things like this, but we've had no issues and it's much cheaper. Back to the guy in the garage. And we're done. Hopefully I was able to give you all the information you need to be able to upgrade your cabinet doors and drawers. If there's something I wasn't clear about or you need more information on, go ahead and drop me a comment. I reply to almost every comment. Really quick, I wanna talk about some of the tools and materials that I used in my project. That way I can give you some sort of recommendation on what worked really well for me in case you're in the same boat and you're trying to gather some of these things up for your project. First and foremost, I highly recommend building this little jig out for installing your cabinet doors. Cutting out one extra style is little to no extra work. This also allowed me to mark equal distances on the top and bottom so that I can center my doors vertically and get repeatable installation points for the hardware. So this was really easy. I highly recommend doing this. I tried a few different clamp systems for the drawer faces. You can use double-sided tape if you want, but I use double-sided tape in a lot of different spaces in the shop. So I went with something that I'm gonna be able to use forever. These, I didn't like. These were cheap in my opinion. You may be able to get these to work. I wasn't able to, but for my money, I'm gonna buy something different. These were probably my favorite clamps. Granted, I didn't get to use them in this application, but for regular size drawers, these are the best. They've got an automatic clamping system that's nice and fast. You can set them ahead of time. So if you're doing an entire kitchen and you've got wide drawers or I would say standard drawers, not narrow drawers, these would probably be my go-to if I was spending the money. The winners for this project were these Rockler drawer face clamps. There's nothing really wrong with them. They do take a little bit of extra work because for every drawer, you've got to screw them on and off. Not really a big deal, but if you're doing 20 drawers, it's gonna get a little annoying. So the ones with the quick release clamps, those would probably be the ones that I spend money on. Uh, but yeah, no problem with these. They worked for narrow drawers also, so that would be good. They would work just as fine for standard or really wide drawers. Another group of products that I use were the Craig suite of cabinet door and drawer installation tools. This one's for your poles and your knobs. Really nice to have a little reference surface and uh, reference measurements so you can get repeatability when it comes to installing those and setting up your installation holes. You can make your own. That wouldn't be a problem. It would be very easy to do. I like having something like this. It's adjustable. It works really well. It's fairly cheap. Good stuff here. For the door hardware hinge installation, this tool rocked too. It came with a Forzner bit that's perfect size for the hinges that I have, and I think it's a standard hinge size, so this should work with almost all of those hinges. And it's got a nice little offset set up here. You'll be able to read about that in the instructions. But again, really good stuff. I'll put links in the description for all of the tools that I recommend here. Lastly for me, I'd like to recommend this DeWalt DCF 850 impact driver. The delicate setting on this made it easy to install the cabinet hardware without worrying about blowing through the MDF. Now, I know that a lot of the other manufacturers have tools just like this, so don't get me wrong. I'm not like a DeWalt or Die guy. I just so happen to have experience with this specific one, and I like it quite a bit, so I do recommend it. Now to my favorite part of the video. This is where we celebrate a project complete, and I show my appreciation for your support. This is the buy me a beer or buy me a drink section. Let's get into it. Ooh. Nope, oh, that's cheating. There we go. Nice. 
So here's a toast, a show of appreciation to those of you supporting the channel and my little dream here. I'd like to start with my Patreon supporters. That's Austin, Armando, Justin, Miguel, Nicholas, Ventislav, Tyler, Tim, and Adam. Seriously, thank you guys. These are past and present supporters. I haven't been uploading for a while, so I've lost some of you guys and I apologize for that, but thank you so much for the support. I have Cash App and Venmo buy me a drink supporters. Thank you guys, this one goes to you. Justin, Renee, Merrick, Jeffrey, Mary, Roman, David, Owen, Minaj, Tom, and Jed. Thank you guys. And then I had a store order already for a shirt, Patrick. So thank you, man, for buying some merch. I hope I randomly run into you one day and see you wearing Wood Nerds gear. But seriously, this goes out to everyone who supports the channel, not just those names that I read, but those of you who are subscribing, liking, commenting, leaving feedback. I really appreciate that. Cheers, you guys. <laughs> yes. Well, that's it for this video. Thank you guys for hanging out and building with me today. I'll see you next time. Thank you all for hanging out and building with me today. I'll see you next time. Whew.